Great. Well, welcome everybody uh, to our Youth Engagement and Native Language Programs uh, National Webinar. Today's webinar is hosted by the Alaska Region TTA Center. We are a resource of the Administration for Native Americans. And um, our Alaska TTA Center team, we've got a um, a full complement of different skill sets, uh, working with all the other regions, uh, delivering different webinars, uh, developing national resources for your application development, um, and of course providing technical assistance uh, to the Alaska tribes in Alaska. And uh, depending on where you're at, uh, you all have different uh, TTA centers that can serve you and provide technical assistance on your projects and, and implementing your programs and your, your grants. Um, we provide uh, project development trainings, uh, pre-application trainings, webinars such as the one we're doing today. Um, and uh, right now we're, we're still in um, application review season, we call it. Uh, we have one FOA that's still open right now, the ILEAD program. And uh, we are still doing technical reviews, free reviews of your draft applications. Um, all the, all the uh, TTA centers uh, provide that as a free service to you. Um, so a couple of upcoming events. Uh, July 19th is the closing date for the ILEAD FOA. And just like I said, um, each of the regional TTA centers uh, can review your draft applications if you're applying for ILEAD. Um, and also we have another national webinar coming up being uh, produced by the Eastern Region, I believe, called uh, Good Health and Good Sense, Sustainability Strategies and Funding Sources. So that'll be on July 20th. Today's webinar goal is to explore strategies for effectively engaging youth in your native community language revitalization and preservation project. Now, we have a very full agenda today. Um, so we have some exciting presenters, different projects, uh, different perspectives um, from different regions. And um, one of the things we did before we launched today is we sent out a pre-webinar poll to kind of uh, get you thinking about, you know, what are some strategies that you can use to engage youth in your programs and your language projects? And uh, we've gotten quite a few responses. We'll share a few of those uh, throughout the webinar and at the tail end if we have time. Um, but one of them, which is kind of the problem statement for this webinar, is just, just the challenge. Uh, this, the response we got was, it's very hard to get the youth involved. So that is a challenge, and that's, that's really uh, why we're, we're here today to explore strategies for engaging youth. We have, we have three guest presenters today. Um, Inye Slaughter with the Indigenous Language Institute. Um, I believe she's based in Santa Fe. Um, we have Alexana Salmon um, in Alaska with the Igayaga Village to share about her project and some, some strategies that they've been using to engage their youth. And then we also have Elisa Peta Ale Maleata with the Le Petual Samoan Language Center, and um, she's going to share some strategies as well. So our first presenter today is uh, Inye Yang Slaughter. She's the Executive Director of the Indigenous Language Institute, and she's, she's been in that position since 1995. Uh, she has a BA in French Literature from the University of California, Berkeley and an associate degree in interior and graphic design from UCLA. She's of Korean heritage. She was born and raised in Japan, um, which is a fascinating uh, country. I just got back from there, uh, Ine. I wish I could speak a lot more Japanese. Um, she's fluent in Japanese, uh, Korean, English, uh, has a working knowledge of French. And um, before, before she moved to Santa Fe, she was at the Getty Conservation Institute in Los Angeles as a special projects coordinator. Um, she's also been assisting us um, with our NLCC um, cohort, providing some technical assistance um, and de developing some resources for that. I know she works with tribes all around the country, uh, 
providing uh, workshops and her expertise. Um, so, um, so and yay, um, feel free to take the floor now. Thank you. and all the participants. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I hope you can hear me? Yep. Okay. So thank you for that introduction. I didn't have to go through the bio myself, which is good. <laughs> so, and um, yes, I've been with the Indigenous Language Institute for 22 years. And uh, basically, the information about us is up here on your screen. But um, just to add to that, we are a national organization that works and serves all the nations and tribes in the USA, but also into Canada. And we have relationships with the Maori um, and people in Scotland who are trying to preserve their uh, uh, endangered Gaelic language. And then our guiding philosophy is to help create speakers. That really, really dictates to us what our focus needs to be when that is our sort of the neon sign that you know blinks and reminds us uh, is this going to help create speakers and linguistics alone will not revitalize our languages is what we heard from linguists themselves and uh, so we must develop oral communication skills and the ability and opportunities to use the language and what we do is research, teach, and share. And briefly, what we mean by research is connecting academic research-based knowledge to immediate usefulness for communities, because there's a huge gap. And then we teach some of the research-based methodologies and um, proven good practices through our workshops and training that happen um, a minimum of seven times a year regionally, usually in New Mexico, <clears throat> excuse me, and Minnesota. And then um, we are also asked to come to different communities throughout the nation to share uh, the training. And then the share part is our mainly our October annual symposium, which happens in New Mexico, where we challenge the presenters and participants to deal with uh, to explore ideas that are really, really um, questions that we all have, but we are afraid to maybe tackle it or ask questions about. You can find more information on our website, so I'll just move on. The topic today is about youth engagement, and language is not, language decline is not a language issue alone. It has all kinds of implications from sociological, political, psychological, educational. And therefore, our approach is to have a multidisciplinary approach to figure out how to revitalize our language. And in our communications with uh, over 300 tribal communities, youth and young adults are a critical population, and yet, they all have a similar struggle with how to get them engaged. So we will see what we found out. So how can we engage, engage youth? The first thing we found is we have to ask our youth for their opinions. We often want to think that we have great ideas, but if it doesn't fit to what they're thinking, it sometimes just goes to the wayside. So how do we ask? What do you want to learn in a language class? It has to be in a safe environment to elicit honest opinions. And the facilitator has to be somebody they like and trust. And um, sometimes we have to really not interpret their I don't care attitude as not caring because they are watching and listening. So you really have to extend the invitation. Um, middle school age group, 13 to 15, are often what I call the lost population. Sometimes they are um, skipped and they are included in this batch or that batch, but really they're a very critical uh, age group. So highly encourage 
involving them in the survey. And then provide incentive to attend. And what I mean by that is it doesn't have to be any material things. Food helps, yeah, but um, it is just a show of gratitude and respect to these young people for participating in the survey or the question. And then finally, when you have some information that's useful, although you may not want to hear it, let's share that with our language program or community and see what we can do to move forward on youth involvement. So here's what we found when we asked the critical question to some youth in various situations. They said, we want to be able to speak it. Speak, speak, speak. That just came up so often. They're tired of learning C-A-N or CAN, uh, colors, animals, and numbers. Then another uh, tribal youth group that came to visit us in 2002 said, we really want to be able to talk in our language about what our peers are facing. These are serious situations or problems, but we want to be able to talk about those things in our language. On a more, um, uh, what is it, uh, 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 sports level, they want to learn how to play basketball in the language so the opponents don't hear our calls. And then uh, um, a Tewa, Tewa would be uh, in the New Mexico, Rio Grande area. He wanted to know the whys of the ceremonies that he does participate in because they just memorize the needs for dance and song, but they really don't understand why we do what we do. And that came up with many, many tribal youth. To continue, I want to learn my language to make sure my younger sisters and brothers can speak it. And this is from a high school kid just recently in 2014. But she said, I have to start with myself. The home is not where the language is, and she's really trying hard to learn it. Another big topic of youth interest is history of my people. They don't get it in school. They are, uh, you know, sporadically getting information here or there. But really, they want to know who they are, where we came from. And then one another, uh, oops, that uh, credit is not showing. But this is from Atewa, also Atewa young lady. Since I, since I started learning my language, I feel more connected to my community. My people are doing their land, but especially to my great great grandma. So the main points are bolded, so I'm assuming people get the PowerPoint and they can look at that and see if it um, rings any bells. And point two is letting the learners lead the learning. We have to trust that they want to, but oftentimes we are not inviting them to become the leader or to in initiate the process of learning. So we found that that might be a step that might be important. So in Learner Leads the Learning, we're shifting the responsibility from teacher and student to more of a lead learner selecting the mentor with whom they want to learn the language. And this could be a family member or a friend. Um, and they get to, the learner also gets to select topics that they are interested in or need. And one example would be, you know, a young man said, oh, I have to memorize um, a prayer because I've been asked to uh, say it for a gathering. And it was very specific. And he found somebody that he could work with. And those are the initiatives that we're looking at, but also just wanting to learn. Because learning has to happen also outside of language classes. And this we found that... Um, it helps involve the community because these people will usually go to families and relatives and they somehow get it asked and they get involved. There are many, many, many speakers who are not um, using the language so we don't know that they are speakers, so we found. So we coined them closet speakers because um, they're there waiting for somebody to possibly get them engaged on a more personal level. So giving the key to the car. <clears throat> you can't learn to speak until you start to actually 
um, I mean, you can't learn to drive until you actually do the driving, so similar uh, situation with language learning. And three, we found that it's very helpful if you assign, especially for school-based language projects that require language use. So it's not um, just from memory or projects that are beautiful to see, but there's no language in it, embedded in it. So I'd like to explore a couple of things that we found were very productive. Digital storytelling. And this is uh, by using computers that you can download freeware. And because the youth are so into technology, it's so easy for them to do this. And what we did with our digital storytelling training was that we, we helped them create the story or the script. You have to do it 75 to 100% of the story in the language. And what that means is oftentimes they would get on the phone and talk to their mentors. Am I saying this right? Because i got to record now. Um, and then because the story is going to be in the learner's voices, and elders' voices, it's very personal, and it really brings ownership to the product that they actually end up with. And you can see lots and lots of examples of what students produce, but also what adults have produced using this technology. Three to five minutes, very short, but some are actually being used by teachers as uh, classroom tools. But youth love to get involved in this kind of project. OK, another one. This I'm going to have to go through it real quickly because of time. But the Youth Language Fair is something ILI uh, uh, implemented starting in 1999. And again, we were saying, where can they showcase and celebrate language? This was all about celebrating and really giving public acknowledgement and praise to those who had the creativity, courage to be in front of people to demonstrate their language ability. And so um, when we first started, we had 12 youth. We had to volunteer our own family members, beg, cajole, uh, bribe others, and we have 12 who showed up. And then back, and then in 2004, I mean, um, we had Actually, that's a typo. I think we had 175 participants. So over the four-year, five-year period, um, the in excitement and the um, involvement was very clearly uh, very successful. So everybody's a winner. There's no judgment on language accuracy because they come from all different language backgrounds. So, so the judges are intentionally picked not representing those languages, so they can really judge them on those other criteria. Uh, because it was so successful, ILI published a how-to book on putting this youth language fair so that community key, communities can do their own fair. And Oklahoma uh, Native American Youth Language Fair picked this up. And it was actually the University of Oklahoma Sam Noble Museum. They're, they have a language uh, department. And they've been doing it now for eight years. And it's a two-day event annually in April. I heard something like 750 youth gather to give presentations. And every year, this becomes like one of, them, one of the projects that they work towards in their schools or in their language programs. You can do, you can learn more about it on this website. That takes us to four. And this connects to what we just saw through the Youth Language Fair and other events. But we do have to celebrate achievements. But we have to celebrate achievements and efforts because it's a long-term goal of becoming conversant. And so we get discouraged during the journey. So achievements are good, and yes, we have to celebrate that, but the efforts need to be celebrated. And efforts, celebration is continuous encouragement, thanking them for being part of this, uh, acknowledging them, and then really, really 
a third bullet point of importance. We have to get away from criticizing. That's not the right dialect, you're not saying it right, that's not the right pronunciation, and other linguistic issues. If they say something and we can understand it, let's celebrate it. That is our kind of our underlying philosophy. And yes, you have to make things better, you have to uh, polish the pronunciation, et cetera, et cetera, but you do it in ways that are encouraging. Visible acknowledgement for efforts and achievements are very helpful. And the next one, I hope, is about that. Yes, some, some ideas that we were shared by other uh, communities. For occasionally, like at the end of quarter, end of semester, or even at graduation, they would have special language sashes. And um, it shows different skill levels, or some people would put um, badges on these sashes that show different skills that they've accomplished. And then on graduation day, a very, very special acknowledgement for the language learners has really brought that whole um, visibility to the, not just them, but also the language work. Awards at public gatherings. And we talked about digital storytelling. Some communities have, um, much like the Youth Language Fair, they held a digital storytelling festival. So they showcased all the things that the youth created. And this could be another big fun thing. And if you have a community newsletter or radio uh, or even local papers and um, media writing up about these achievements and efforts um, really have great effect. Why is all this important? It's good for the individuals who are involved, but it really helps raise the status of our language, especially in the minds of our youth. When they walk outside into the world and there's no language there, and then lack of it in their own community, they really conclude that maybe language is not important. Our language is not important after all. So within our community and family, the increasing use of the language, celebrating it, really equates to making language relevant and valuable. And that value has been lost over time. So it is, and it is really the children and youth who can maybe really incite this excitement. Oh, that was it. I hope I was within the time limit. But I know later we have um, a Q&A, hopefully. So thank you for the opportunity to share with you. Thank you, Inye. Kuyana, uh, Chuknuk. Um, yeah, I didn't get any um, questions posted uh, in the chat box yet. Um, so if you do have a question for Inye, go ahead and post it in the chat box, and uh, we will pick up a couple Q&A um, at the tail end. Um, thanks again. That was that was uh, awesome. Some really helpful insight on some strategies. Um, so our free webinar poll. A um, couple of responses we got. Um, some of them mirror what uh, Ine was sharing. Now, these are suggestions coming from you, the attendees and participants. Uh, offer incentives like rewards, recognition for learning and using the language, and uh, Use roles in language use and learning and development, such as reading, acting, documentation, reciting, and recording. And then again, uh, community recognition and awareness for the hard work of learning the language. Mm -hmm. those, were, those, were, those were some suggestions that came forth. Excellent. So, okay, um, our next speaker um, is Alexandra Salmon, and uh, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna pronounce her project uh, in the Cusco Bay dialect, and uh, like Ine said, uh, no teasing about different dialects. So this is the Fankuta Anarayagai Nanbach Pagamut Yuk Student Project. Uh, but actually uh, what uh, <clears throat> Alexana is focused on is preserving the Iliamna dialect, and she'll be talking about that and also how she's engaging her youth. Um, so, um, Alexandra Salmon, she, she's Yupik uh, from the village of Igiagic. She studied at Dartmouth College uh, with a focus on Native American studies and anthropology. She's uh, raising a family of six children in Igiagic uh, with Tarek Anilin. 
She's currently the project director of the ANA Language Grant, um, loves the outdoors and traveling the world, and she's uh, one of the many movers and shakers uh, in uh, the amazing community of Igiagig. And uh, she had to, she warned me that we might possibly hear uh, sounds outside, which is literally the earth shaking because they're building and uh, so things are happening in Igiaga. It's exciting, and I'm really happy that uh, you're here, Alexana. Um, the floor is yours. Guyana, Anthony, Fingo Atka, Ababi Raimu, Ababi Raimu, Matta, Wam, Kasabat Stunaska, Alexana Simon, Ria Ramiu Munga. I Papa, we shall Arvin Lizanek, Ignan Kastukuk, Leak Hukuk, Yukstun, Mash Hokunuk, Uksuk. So um, here in Igiagig, my partner and I are raising six children, six youth, so that kind of helps our program. And we've been learning together Yupik for two years. We're, in our th we're about to enter our third year of our three-year language grant. And the way it's designed is we have the master apprentice, we have um, three fluent first language elder speakers, and then we hired six apprentices and we uh, selected the apprentices based on interest, but also the apprentices we chose all have uh, young children living in their home. Um, and then at the same time, we launched our program with community classes that were actually held in the school because we had the support of uh, both the elementary and high school teachers. So um, community classes have been really successful. And on top of community classes, we were targeting we were inviting, they're open to all of the community, but we're really targeting the elementary, middle school, and high school four days a week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we would have a 30-minute slot um, after lunch. So we would try to make lunch the lunch period as much UPIC as possible with a UPIC table, and then we'd go right into our 30-minute UPIC classes. And um, in addition, our target population, of course, are the babies and preschool-age children, so we were hoping in the first year of the grant, we were hosting what we call UMLU, which is nest, language nest, three hours a week. And this coming academic year, it will be 15 hours a week. Um, so we've just been slowly building our exposure to the young kids. And I think, um, let's see here. The next slide, Anthony wanted me to talk about our community trip to New Zealand, where we were able to learn from the Maori. We took, um, most of the community, our, our whole village is 70 people, so we took most of um, the community and school, the entire school to New Zealand. And that was a youth-driven project. First of all, the youth selected where in the world they wanted to visit, and then they fundraised for that trip through, um, we reintroduced Yupik dancing, and they were able to take what they were learning with their language, with their language learning and other cultural knowledge such as dancing, and they were able to compete in talent shows, or our dance group was even hired to perform at a regional event. So all of this income made from, from this was used towards the fundraising for that project, in addition to potlucks and finding other donors. Um, and in New Zealand, we stayed at, um, pictured here is a school under the principal, Mike Murray, and the entire school is is uh, taught in Maori. They don't actually teach the Maori language there because the students that enroll are already expected to be fluent. But that was my first time being able to visit a library where every single publication you saw was all in Maori. It was incredibly um, inspirational. And at that cultural exchange, we went to two schools and we had our, our youth with Maori youth that are all both passionate about culture and language learning. And it was just good to be around and inspired by people on the other side of the world doing, um, you know, similar similar activities. And just this last spring, the students again fundraised on their own planned trip to um, Arizona and New Mexico. And I went along as the project director because we coordinated on the side very specific language learning activities, and we visited immersion schools where they spoke in Apache and Zuni so that our youth we're meeting other youth in the country that are passionate about learning, um, learning, and they had an amazing cultural exchange. So 
that's been an important part of our youth engagement. We're from rural, very remote Alaska, so sometimes our students um, do not even have the resources to travel out of Idiagig, let alone the state. But working together to fundraise and and bring them this exposure has been has been the ticket to engagement. Really, we really have them fully engaged when it when it comes to um, these type of trips. And it's good for building their sense of cultural identity. But right from the beginning of our program, so those are activities the community was driving. They weren't they weren't coming from the ANA language program necessarily, but we made sure that language was a large part. And part of being able to introduce yourself in Yupik and speak the language is is part of that confidence building um, exercise for when we bring them to these cultural exchange forums. Um, the methods that we have used here locally, we began our program with a UPIC values training. We brought in our consultants right from the beginning and met as a community, all age groups involved. We made sure everyone, whether they had a UPIC name or not, were recognized through this UPIC naming process. Um, we brought that back. So when I, so I'm 31. When I was a child, I was called my UPIC name all the time. Then we advanced one more generation after we, we stopped. Even though most children born in this community had a Yupik name, we stopped calling them by it. And le but over time, young people barely, probably at the most, knew 10 simple vocabulary words in Yupik. Um, so we, we made, this was a total community effort. We brought in the consultants at the beginning, did the values training. Um, it was an emotional, spiritual, a gathering to kick off to launch our program. Then we went right from the beginning using each other's UPIC names and, and had immersion trainings so that we knew when we were gathering we were going to be doing it in immersion style so that we were not, uh, so that we were staying away from English because our kids are surrounded by English. Um, so when we get, when we teach, the, when we go on to teach in the classroom, it's all UPIC from the beginning. And um, we learned from the consultant how to teach using total physical response so that it's not so that it's really interactive based learning so that it's, so our classes are not so called boring or textbook style they're they're um, pretty interactive and we we do a lot of laughing actually through the total physical response also our lesson plans and activities are all based on the already in place subsistence and cultural activities based learning. So depending on what time of year, in the fall we will do moose hunting, duck hunting type um, TPR activities. And because what our children are doing after school is they're downriver hunting these moose and birds. And so if they're learning the language and during the day in the classroom and after school's out they're actually doing the hunting, then that's, we just keep it very relevant like um, Ms. Slaughter was mentioning. And there are not a lot of cultural activities happening with the curriculum we have at our school anyway. So being able to bring cultural activities into the classroom is always exciting and engaging to the kids. So um, we've done butchering of caribou during, I'm sorry, I'm teaching a little bit. <laughs> you never know who's going to stop in. Um, and we, we do like making a gouda to the Eskimo ice cream. We do any kind of activities that they might they might not even be learning at home, but at least they're getting they're getting it through our language program. Their favorite game to play, and this is uh, the upper classroom, is um, Jeopardy. So this is grades. This is like children 11 through seniors. So we pair them up, and I I arrange the teams, and they play Jeopardy. So it's the first Monday. Of, a, of the total physical response lesson planning would be an introduction to five new words, and the next day would be being able to recognize those words being spoken in sentences, and then the next day might be making your own sentences using the vocabulary. But the final day is kind of a jeopardy of everything that had been learning throughout the throughout the um, whole year. You know, and now it'll be two years. So that Jeopardy game keeps on growing, and they love it. We play it with real buzzers and prizes, and um, they get really competitive. And those kids will take notes and take those notes home and study them before Jeopardy. So that's, that's been our one game that they love the most, but we've also played other games. 
we always try to include food. So, um, for example, fresh food is very hard to come by in our village. So we order a special fresh fruit for one of the special lunch days. And whether a, an older teenager thinks it's cool or not to learn Yupik, if they want part of that, if they want inclusion in being offered, they have to come up to the elder and ask them in Yupik, I would like that biuchtoa, atsanik, or whatever we're offering. So most all of the kids motivated for whatever reason have learned how to engage even at the sh smallest level with our elders to communicate what they what they want and need. Um, we include food with our elementary classes especially. There's a lot of language around food um, and so we so we have that and we have we do a lot of fun like um, that first picture of us on the front page of our project, that was us out doing a berry picking activity in the fall. We have about four or five different types of berries right outside the school doors. So even though I'm teaching a 30 minute UPIC session, that's enough time to run out and pick berries and talk about them. Um, and it's it's right there so the elder doesn't even have to walk far. Um, so that's always fun for the kids. The more hands on, the more fun. And um, we hold a goose camp in the springtime, so the kids are out camping. This last year, this last spring, the whole goose camp theme was language learning. So we were able to do scavenger hunts. The kids were, um, the whole camp was had posters of the different, because it's not in the classroom anymore, you have a whole new language environment. We put signs everywhere we were so that they would know um, how to communicate about that in Yupik. And I'm just going to speed it up real quickly because I think we are running out of time. For me, I don't have an elder in the classroom every day and it's the most important for the children to learn from the first language speaker. So a lot of times using TPR, total physical response, I will go and pre-record everything I want to use with the elder and then I will use just a simple wireless um, speaker with my cell phone and I bring that language to the classroom using modern technology so that our students are hearing it no matter what from the master. And then we get to learn together. I get to help pronounce with them um, and it's and they are attracted to that modern technology but at least now they're hearing it from the first language speaker. And lastly, this is a, a few photos of what it looks like, what our language looks like. Uh, Gusik there is holding up a sign. We will not speak English, Yupik only. We taught them to police themselves to stay in the Yupik language. For the older kids, it was much more of a presentation portfolio. Um, but just to get back to what to tie it into what Ms. Slaughter's last slide said, you know, raising the status of our language in the minds of our youth, showing them it is relevant and valuable, that just really struck a chord. And we we've done that with our youth. We've tried to do that has been our strategy. So we have used it on the basketball court. They have used um, their their plays in Yupik. They've given them Yupik titles. We have renamed every single building in our village a Yupik with a Yupik name and not an English name and just a graphic to help explain what it is that purpose of that building is. So now our kids are seeing our village relabeled. We started using Yupik language on Facebook because we have a village info zone and we're all friends with each other. So um, young 15 year old with, you, with um, Facebook who is my friend will see that I'm posting something in Yupik. And we've started singing happy birthday in Yupik at different birthday parties. And we've changed our monthly newsletter, which is the only publication in our community. We've changed its whole title to Yupik. And every month our program contributes what we've been learning. So hopefully with our kids seeing that, it's a silent reinforcement to them that, oh yes, this language learning is relevant and it is valuable. Um, and so I'm, it was an honor to present to you today. I look forward to questions. Um, and and that's about it. Boyana Alexander, I'm I'm sitting here with uh, goosebumps just listening to the exciting stuff that you're doing there. And I just wanted to share briefly. I had to chuckle when you were talking about uh, the six kids. So for those of you that aren't familiar with some of our villages that are very small in Alaska, a huge issue we're faced with is keeping our schools open. And uh, when when my wife and I lived in uh, Platinum, where she was the only uh, school teacher. Uh, the site administrator had several kids and that helped to keep the school open. So um, 
Anyway, um, can you also, Micah, can you unmute um, Inye? Uh, there's two questions I want to respond to real quick. Uh, there was a question about have there been any language uh, festivals in Alaska? I don't know. Um, uh, Is that a question for Ine? Yeah, that's a question for Ine. Yeah, I'm not um, familiar with any at the moment, but um, if I hear of any, I certainly. I think we've had some language summits. I think I saw that uh, Alaska Native Heritage Center is in here. I'm not sure if they could post. Uh, they've had some different uh, uh, meetings. Um, not sure if it's been this, this, you know, like you structured your uh, youth uh, language festivals. Right. Um, there was I, a. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not aware that it is. You know, it's different from we're going to have a gathering, so you kids come over and do a thing, singing. It's different from that. It, this is a whole day or two days dedicated to a bunch of kids. So that kind of format I'm not familiar with. I haven't heard yet. Okay. But I'd love to know if there is something happening. Okay. The other, the other, uh, it was kind of a comment. I'm not sure if it was a question uh, from Stephen O'Brien, who actually used to work at the Yapkundit Nagavik. Uh, he was commenting about, uh, you know, you went to New Zealand, and and we have in Alaska through uh, Ayapkun and other programs have sent people over as well to look at their methodology. And I think he was asking uh, for some feedback on. The, Immersion, their immersion approach as it's being used in Alaska. Um, so I don't know, uh, Alexandra, if you want to comment on that or. Well, actually, sure. The, we, we, after visiting New Zealand and they started the language nest model in my, I, I'm, that's what I heard anyway. And we learned from, from that over there. And when we came back home, we called our program UNLU, which is the same thing, uh, the nest. And the idea there, too, is you just hang a sign on any building, even if you have no funding. Um, we will speak Yupik here, or this is, they, they would hang signs that say, Terio, we're going to, this is, we're going to be speaking the language in this spot, whether we have any resources or not. It takes one speaker and a, any number of learners, and you put them together and just start there. You don't need a whole program. You don't, so that was, that was kind of the inspiration um, that we learned over there in New Zealand. Okay. But that model of the language nest connecting the first, the, the babies with the elders and all ages in between, but the most important is that, um, you know, our youth are hearing it from the first language speaker. Right. And of course, we have, you know, with ANA, we have the Esther Martinez Immersion Program that is specifically focused on language nests. So. All right, Kweona, Alexana, and Ine, I'm going to go to our third um, speaker, um, and that is Elisabetta Alai Maleata. Um, she's uh, coming from Hawaii, and um, she is the founder and director of the first Samoan Language Center in Hawaii, Lepetoao, serving Hawaii born Samoan youth in Oahu. Um, she's a frequent uh, contributor to a lot of our ANA uh, webinars, so I, I appreciate it very much, Elisabetta, for, for joining us today. And um, a, few, a little bit more of her background, she serves as a Sunday school teacher, director at her church, uh, which in her early years also had a, a big influence, um, where she promotes the Samoan language and culture. Um, she was exposed uh, in her youth when she was in American Samoa to Samoan schools through through the churches. Um, she graduated from the American Samoa Community College in 1990, um, and then she became an elementary teacher for 10 years in American Samoa, uh, and then got her bachelor's degree in 2001 and her master's of education and teaching from the University of Hawaii of, uh, at Manoa in 2004. And she's lived in Hawaii since 1998, uh, where she also got a second degree in language studies and has raised uh, four children in Hawaii. And uh, so, Elisa Petta, thank you for joining us and for sharing a little bit about your experience uh, through a previously funded ANA grant and also uh, your ongoing efforts uh, to engage youth in your program. Aloha and aloha from Hawaii. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. 
Yep. Um, thank you, Anthony, for that wonderful introduction. I am so grateful and blessed to have this opportunity to share with the, you know, Native community, com communities out in Alaska as well as all over um, our nation. Um, you know, Lesser to All Samoan Language Center started as a community-based project, and we're slowly moving in to offer um, supplementary support for Hawaii Department of Education. We have done um, many outreach to several Samoan communities in the United States, as well as um, in partnership with, uh, with New Zealand, American Samoa Department of Education, as well as um, other um, organizations in the community. So um, thank you very much, um, Anthony, for um, this opportunity for the Samoan community to share, um, you know, what we're doing in Hawaii so that we can spread the light. Since the name of our school means the two is star, all is morning or, um, you know, light. So our effort and our mission, um, you know, focuses on the hope to reach out to every corner of the world and share the knowledge that we have so that we can um, continue preserving and maintaining our, our native language. Um, the Letter to Our Samoan Language Center is committed to building strong families by serving to bridge the cultural generational gap between Samoan parents and youth and the broader society in which they live. Our mission it, we increase the literacy in the Samoan language for our youth and understand the Samoan culture to build a Samoan identity. And we also try to serve as a model for other Samoan organizations and church communities. This is our ninth year and we're moving to our tenth year. Um, by October, yeah, we'll reach ten years of, of, of services in the community. Uh, just to share with, with um, with our listeners, um, we were funded, our first funding was provided by Hawaii People's Fund here in Hawaii in 2008. Um, then we, on the second, the second funding was provided by the Administration for Native Americans in 2013 to 2016. Um, in between, we received some support from Hawaii Community Foundation and the Rising Foundation. So, um, 2016, which was last year, ended our ANA funding, and we were so grateful that our community was strong enough to stand up and continue the project. And this year, um, 2016 of October um, to September of 2017, we were um, supported by the city and county of Honolulu through the community services um, by providing us some funding to continue our project in the community. So, you know, throughout that whole um, period of receiving support and resources, we worked diligently with, the, with our community to build resources as well as provide outreach support and develop more language programs throughout this school year during that time. But before um, receiving all of that um, resources, five years, the Mexico to All Samoan Language Center provided volunteer services. So the whole community came together and, you know, looked at the needs of the community and we were able to volunteer for five years before any of these funding um, kicked in. So um, we're so grateful for the blessings and everything that we had received before. Um, I'd like to share, I want to mention, with our vision to empower our youth to be productive and contributing citizens with a strong self-image and knowledge of their Samoan heritage. Our vision has the word youth. The, the focus of today's um, webinar is looking at youth engagement. One of the concepts and one of the um, the philosophy of Letter to All is looking at language not as a deficiency model, but as an empowerment model. When we first arrived, I just want to share with everyone, when we first arrived here in Honolulu back in 1998 with my children, I had twin boys, um, not knowing and understanding the system of Hawaii Department of Education, 
I registered my children to enroll in the public school, I put down that they speak Samoan and English. They were immediately placed in ESL classes. And throughout that time, without understanding you know, what ESL classes are for, um, I, as an educator, I thought it will provide my children support because they also learn a different language at home. Unfortunately, it turned out to be um, a model where they were placed there so that they can be um, taught, you know, specific of the English language with phonics and an ongoing, um, you know, teaching in terms of of a lower level of language approach. So at the time, after one year placing them in in the ESL class. Um, my children, the twin boys, came home and said, Mom, we're bored. We want to learn more because we are, a lot of what is taught in the ESL classes were lower level phonics. And these were things that they've already learned from home before they entered public school. That time on, up until now, I have four children. I never placed the word, you know, that my children speak Samoan because. I refused to put them in ESL classes, mainly because of the fact that they, you know, they receive, they look at, you know, teaching language as a deficiency model. So for us to step in as educators, we want to see language as an empowerment model, a model where we conduct a needs assessment or you know, an opportunity for our children to recognize their voices, their opinions, their needs, and their concepts of approach. So we, we try our best as parents as well as language advocates to try and change approaches from the education perspective. So with our vision at Lefetuo, we want these youth to be contributing citizens with strong self-image and knowledge of the, their Samoan heritage, something that is missing from our public education. And we continue to work as language advocates to see or to, um, you know, enlighten um, our community to see the value of language as an empowerment, um, as, a, as a, an accomplished skill. It's, it's a needed skill and it's an accomplished skill by children. When they learn language, that is something unique that is different from others as well. So, just to share with you, some of the concepts that we had mentioned, you know, we're incorporating in our implementation involves um, bringing the youth to be part of the learning. Um, like I mentioned before, it's important for us to conduct a needs assessment or survey in the community to identify or involve youth. And for them, we, they, they do mention their needs. Um, they, they do mention their opinions and, and all the, also the concepts of trying to meet those needs. So as, as um, language advocates and, and leaders, we discuss these um, you know, needs from the youth and we, we usually provide you know, the concepts or develop the, the lessons around their needs. And as you can see with the teacher training, it's one of the most important aspects of our program is to build these professional development to help um, train our teachers. Um, you know, we do assessment in the community, collect the survey, and then we discuss results of these surveys. And then we develop our lessons to cater to those needs. So, um, I'd like to mention as well with several of our students that have been uh, participants or learners of the program, we've, we've used them as teachers for our preschool classes and we try to use them as, as um, technology uh, mentors and peers. And it was mentioned by Amini as well as Alex Anna during their presentation. So we want to empower the youth that way. We want them to um, to understand that the basic knowledge that they um, receive from learning the language in the beginning can be utilized. And, and in order for us to utilize them, we also train them to become future teachers of Samoan language. 
we try our best to develop and share and provide outreach in, in the Samoan community here in Hawaii. Um, we've learned that we have about 70, almost 70 church communities in the state of Hawaii. Church communities are considered urban villages of Samoa. When, um, in our community back home on the island, we have several villages that work diligently to have um, youth um, activities and programs to help um, enhance learning the language and culture. But when they move outside of the island, what do we do as a community in order to revive, in order to continue that, that um, perspective or um, approach as a village? So we have several church communities in the state of Hawaii, and we look at those communities as urban villages where we cater to them. We also provide services and outreach support for um, their youth organizations. And all of these church um, communities, they have youth organizations. And our role as a, as a Samoan language program is to provide them, you know, a free copy of our curriculum, a free copy of our resources when they have to contact us. We have to cater to the needs in order for them to see the importance and, and the value, they value the services that we provide in, in the state of Hawaii. When we gathered our survey, of course, um, as Amy and Alexander shared, technology is one of the most um, top um, concepts that youth love to be involved with. We have a strong technology camp program that runs every um, you know, summer break, winter break, spring break, um, as well as fall break. Um, Nefetumau is more like a safety net, which um, provides supplementary education when it comes to, um, you, know, you know, the public education um, schedule throughout the year. Um, we also follow that schedule because we need to follow the norm of everyday activities of families and children, and of course, Working side by side with the Department of Education in Hawaii is is one of the best ways in order for us to engage youth to to see the value of language of their heritage language in the in education. Um, of course, as um, and me had mentioned, a lot of what we we introduce or teach or bring in this implementation at Left It To All is not available in public education. We teach history, we, we, we teach history of families as well as look at activities to preserve and maintain the Samoan language, but a lot of these opportunities are not available in the public education. So, um, you know, families see the value of what we do. As you can see the picture right there, we have some of our children as writers, as authors of stories. They would hear stories from their parents, and we, we engage them in technology camps throughout the school year so that they can document, so they can be authors of these stories, and, you know, they have ownership over their learning. So we engage the, the children to include, um, to become authors, and they are empowered to be the ones that have the ownership of, 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 of the stories from their family and they documented in technology. Uh, thank you to ANA, they provided funding, which funded um, a lot of our technology equipment. Every student that enters the doors at Nefetua Samoa Language Camp uh, receives an iPad, um, which provides them the opportunity to write stories and share stories. Um, we also teach them basic um, you know, technology skills so that they are able to become good presenters. Um, you know, these are skills that is needed within the public education as well when they go beyond, um, you know, high school to pursue college um, careers or college, college degrees. Another um, need from the youth is arts performance. Of course, in the Samoan community, we are strong. Um, community people that love to, you know, perform, that love to entertain the community. And through language, um, through the songs, as well as um, the movement, it tells a story. 
And it's very important for us as language educators to tell that story, to teach the story behind the songs, behind, you know, the moments of, 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 of every action that they make, you know, that they do in our performance process. So, you know, our concept with the SSUL, we include all of that in our, in our teaching, in our language programs. And how can we showcase and we serve the showcase as an assessment tool when they have to present what they've learned in the classroom by being part of an event. So an annual event that happens here in the, in the state of Hawaii is the We Are Samoa event. It's an annual youth um, you know, um, celebration or festival out at Polynesian Cultural Center in Laie. And what we do as a community-based program, we reach out and identify areas where these events happen. And we take our children and they showcase what they've learned in the classroom. Most importantly, they are the ones that present, you know, that does all the presentation and showcases everything in front of, in front of the audience. And this, we can say, is an assessment of the achievement and the celebration of what they learned in the, in the language classes. Art of tattooing, of course. You have to bring art of tattooing in the language program. Um, in the Samoan community, tattooing is such an important, um, you know, I would say uh, an art. And um, in order for, for the children to be exposed and to um, understanding the history behind tattooing, um, we have to include it in our curriculum. And uh, throughout the year of our journey, we were able to document and collect and consolidate um, a lot of the, um, the strategies, the motifs, the patterns, and try to document that so that it's included in our curriculum that's given to a lot of our community organizations. And as we can see, the exploitation of tattooing with the culture aspect of, of Samoan culture, um, it's very, very important to teach our youth about the value, about the importance, about the sacredness of, of such art in our culture. And to do that, the language program, of course, with the culture integration is where education happens. And, you know, when they're taught, they know how to respect. They know how things connect. And they are able to, um, you know, be empowered as, and that, you know, knowing their identity as someone. We have an annual um, umu, we call it um, umu. It's an outdoor cooking um, festival or event, which happens, um, you know, before um, we have, a, you know, the Thanksgiving celebration in, in, the, in our community. So for us, we bring the um, families and children to learn how to prepare food. And like it was mentioned before, food has a lot of um, um, language involved, and of course, the culture as well. The hands-on approaches that we provide at Lefetua Samoan Language Center is so um, unique and very, um, it's, it's very fulfilling for a lot of the families because they are not exposed to the traditional ways of preparing food in the community, of course. And Umu, in the norm of a lot of our families living in the state of Hawaii, I'm sure with the, with the U.S., is the oven, you know, the indoor, the kitchen oven that we have. But, you know, having them to um, have the opportunity to learn the traditional way of cooking food is, is such a, um, a treasure to them. And a lot of times when we host our, our UMU event after teaching the children in the classroom, um, you know, it's always uh, filled with families and children. And we even have some grandparents and, and grandmothers tagging along. You know, they are so um, hunger. They're hunger to be part and also to smell the, the you know, the taste of, of traditional food that we usually have at home. So with Lefetuao, we build these types of, of, of community engagement 
program so that they, they have this opportunity. So for us as leaders, we reach out to every area of the island that can provide us these open spaces so that we can have the opportunity for the children to learn as well as to um, be part of the, you know, with their, their parents to be part of the education um, process. Uh, intergenerational activities, of course, with our elders, they are the, I would say, they have the in-depth knowledge of our language. So having the children as interviewers and, you know, we try to bring our elders so that they can also record and document their stories. They also conduct the interview and, um, you know, share and also, you know, the elders would share with our youth about different activities or different um, things that they would like to learn. So it's very important to connect with our elders in the community. We try our best to um, involve them in, in our implementation. They provide storytelling, heritage documentation, and of course, something that is very important, it, it really enhances respectful relationships. The respectful relationships we call in Samuel Vahastan Wai between an elder, an older person, and, and a young person. So, you know, in our classes, I usually teach our children, some of our students in the public school um, after school program, to address our teachers, it's the most respectful manner to address the teacher. So instead of saying auntie, instead of saying teacher, we use the language to infuse within, in terms of acknowledging the person that is, you know, that is present. And our teachers are important, um, you know, leaders or important uh, figure within the classroom. So how can we get the children to respect them? So bringing the language, the Samoan language, provides a, uh, a sense of, 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 of respect, a sense of valuing um, the, that respectful relationship between uh, a teacher as well as a student. So at every moment when I'm at the mall or at a park, when some of our students and parents are present, they would always address me, and whenever they speak those words, it, you know, it really hits Heart in your heart, knowing that they also carry the language beyond the classroom. So, um, of course, we try to incorporate strategies so that they can also see the value of utilizing that with, you know, beyond just um, being in the classroom and learning all of this. Of course, field trips. You love field trips and outdoor activities, um, you know. Our teachers, as well as our, um, you know, our leaders, try to enrich these field trips so that there is language and culture involved. For example, of course, in Hawaii we have the Honolulu Zoo. One of the field trips that we took is back in the days. The children learned about fishing in the sea, of course, um, the different names in Taiwan. And when we took them to the zoo, I mean the, the aquarium. We had, the teachers had to teach them or introduce them uh, different stations in the, in, in the aquarium by introducing them in Samoan, bringing stories in Samoan or legends that connect to a certain type of, of, of fish. So we want to engage them in different outdoor events or field trips, but ensure that, that there is, um, more language and culture connection. Um, stories, they love to hear stories and legends. And of course, if we have a lot of Samoan resources, which is something that we are trying our best to document stories, and so it's written in Samoan and English, um, you know, we can take a lot of that learning so they can read at home and be exposed more to um, Samoan language. Like I shared before, we have more than 70 church communities, Samoan church communities here in the state of Hawaii. We try our best to provide support with our church leaders um, in Samoa and Hawaii through spiritual and moral teaching, education and literacy, and re reinforce social and family structure, 
um, facilitate traditional cultural practices. And a lot of our churches, they have facilities. So we try to bring workshops and activities to, the, to their community. Uh, the church community is where we find a lot of Samoan speakers that can teach the language. So, um, like I mentioned, it's considered an urban village or a surrogate village in Samoan communities abroad. And I've shared a lot of successful practices, and some of the practices was mentioned by Alexandra and Anthony. Um, Hands-on approaches is the key. Uh, I think um, you know, moving away from lectures and also uh, book type um, you know, teaching methods is no longer, um, I would say, a, you know, a form that is considered uh, you know, more attractive to you. So providing more hands-on approaches and engaging them to be part of the hands-on training or, or teaching is is very um, attractive to a lot of our youth nowadays. Um, of course, we have our language curriculum. Um, our curriculum is also available to um, anyone that is interested to, um, you know, to learn about what we we put together and also um, document it so that can help um, the your community. Feel free to let us know, and we'll be able to send you um, a copy. Um, we shared about our funding sources. Currently, at this time, we only have um, the CA County um, Community Services uh, um, GIA grant, and we are so grateful for support from from our community as well as our teachers. Um, I think that's pretty much what I want to share. Um, I think um, with our program here in the state of Hawaii. It's important that we provide services that will ultimately strengthen our youth identity, which promotes academic success and fosters civic engagement in our community. I thank you so much for having me and um, the time to listen in during um, this presentation. Thank you, Elisa. But, uh, um and thank you. Uh, you know, all of our presenters are incredibly busy, so I really appreciate um, all of you taking the time out to share with us your experiences. Um, at least, Beth, there was one question about uh, whether Hawaiian immersion schools are part of the public school system. Um, there are several Hawaiian immersion schools on island that is part of the public school system. But um, the only one that I know at the time during my um, teacher training in the University of Hawaii was the one in Pope um, Elementary School. Um, at Pope, um, they they had a you know Hawaiian immersion for you know preschool all the way to third grade, and then fourth grade that's when English is infused within the, the classroom. Um, I'm not quite sure, but I know for a fact that. Um, there are immersion, a lot of Hawaiian immersion schools on island as well as the outer island, um, and they're providing a, a wonderful, um, you know, I would say a model to some of us. And um, I, I would like to also acknowledge them because um, through my work at the University of Hawaii when I was there at the College of Education through the Center of Disability Studies, I was brought into a, a you know an emergent school in the outer island, and right when we entered the campus, all math, science, all the subject areas were taught in Hawaiian, and it really inspired me um, to actually look at a, a same model with our um, one community. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to need to wrap this up here. Um, the Pre-webinar poll. Um, we'll send. I'm going to send this out there, everybody. Uh, some of the responses that we got. And uh, the other thing, before we wrap up, I wanted to highlight that uh, the on the on the national website, we have a lot of resources here that you can look up. 
Um, the webinars that we record are posted here. Um, there's a native language project compendium that describes many of the different language projects. This is in the, net, in the resource directory. There's a uh, language grantee promising practices guide from 2013 with a lot of uh, best practices that you could look up. And the other thing on the national website, if you're looking to talk and reach out to other programs, there is a current grantees map that's really helpful that you can you can um, look up the different preservation and maintenance or Esther Martinez immersion programs and also our, our more recent uh, language community coordination demonstration projects that, that are underway right now. So those are just a few things that you can find on the national uh, ANA website. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up now. Um, and uh, Mike, if you could send out the evaluation, we will be sending in an email with um, the pre-webinar poll responses and some additional URLs that were shared during the, the presentations today. Um, and also, if you didn't get a chance to fill out the evaluation, we'll send that link as well. We really appreciate the feedback. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I know I went over a little bit here. Um, I apologize for that, but it's just so much, uh, uh, so much to share. Um, this uh, concludes our webinar today, and um, thanks again for attending. Uh, and uh, take care.